thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm going to introduce and uh, have a great conversation with my co-panelists shortly. Uh, but before I do, we have a movie here to show you, um, because one of the partners of the transaction, Rock USA, couldn't be here today. Uh, we want to make sure you got a great sense of I, the work that they do, the, uh, uh, helping people, <laughs> helping people uh, acquire and uh, preserve wealth. Um, and uh, it's really fantastic. It's a, a short um, segment that a PBS station in Colorado did about uh, one of the communities uh, there. So take it away, and we'll see you on the other side. Hay uh, familias que vive eh, abuelita, mamá y nietos. Sí, es una, es una comunidad muy bonita. Donde cabe uno, caben dos. The Spanish version of the saying, if I eat, we all eat, takes on a very real meaning here. People is very proud to have uh, their garden. This is the kind of place where neighbors share their food, help take care of each other's kids, truly know one another. There are some residents that they're being helping the elders one to keep the backyard clean and to maintain their, their, their houses. There's a spirit of collaboration and family that's palpable in mobile home parks. In this place in particular. This is the LMP uh, Longmon uh, own community. Encapsulates what it means to work together for a shared goal. There are not a lot of uh, mobile home parks here in this area. Actually, this is the only one in Longmont that is a resident-owned community. About three years ago, owners of these mobile homes were told the land underneath them was going up for sale. In order to buy the park when the park is on sale, the community needs to get together and it has to be uh, at least 50%, 50 plus 1% who really wanted to buy the, the, that they have the agreement to buy the park. With help from organizers like Luz Galicia, most residents agreed they were going to put in an offer. They partnered with Thistle Rock USA, one of the nation's largest nonprofits, helping residents finance and run their own communities. And on February 1st, 2019, residents bought the land for $3.2 million. They have this, uh, that is the bulletin board where they keep informed the residents. LMP became the second resident-owned community with the Rock model in the state. They're one of the luckiest ones that they were able to purchase their park. They didn't do it alone. The Longmont City Council approved a $300,000 loan to help residents purchase the community. So that's like our goal this summer is like completely finish the outside. These homeowners say it's all worth it. To move here, it was like a big weight off our shoulders. Like we felt like... Oh, we're going to be okay. Sandra Garcia moved in with her husband and two kids after residents took over. Yeah, that's why we found this place, because we were looking for something affordable. Sandra lost her job when the pandemic first started. And help came in the form of lowered rents for everyone. And in the time you've been here, how many times have you guys raised your rent? Never. <laughs> I think they were supposed to lower it. That won't be the first time they lowered the rent. During the pandemic, Sandra says everyone's rent was reduced to help families like hers who were losing jobs. I think like people rarely like move out of here. I don't think they do <laughs> because it's just, you know, like too good. This but rent I cut not only kept Sandra above water, but it helped them save. They since put up a new fence and created an outdoor oasis. And with like how low like our like rent or I guess payment is monthly, it like really helped us a lot with a lot of the like remodeling. Sandra is a part of the board of directors that helps run the community. They have monthly meetings where they talk about the budget, bylaws and enforcing community rules. Thankfully, like us as neighbors, like we don't handle that. The management company does. So that's nice. It works out great for Sandra, so she can focus on building up the community she loves so much. Like, at least on our end, we try to, like, keep everything right because we know we're not going to find anything this good, so why lose it? And then start over again, stress out with high rents or high mortgages. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, 
Just uh, going to jump into it. Um, my name is Ruben Tag. I work for uh, PGM Real Estate, which is Prudential's third-party asset management company. I worked in the Impact Investments Group, um, and uh, I'm here today with Miliana and Akobi, uh, who are going to talk about this transaction that we uh, funded earlier this year uh, to Rock USA. I do have a couple slides about Rock USA. I'm going to put up just quickly so you can get a little bit of a background in the organization. You obviously saw uh, the, you know, the great work that they did for that community in Colorado. Um, but as soon as these slides are up, you'll get a little bit more of a flavor of it. Uh, so, you know, manufactured housing, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is in some parts of the country the predominant type of housing, actually. And in many parts of the country, it's the predominant type of affordable housing that's out there. Um, in some states, you have thousands and thousands of these communities, um, and for many people, that is the only way that they're able to live anywhere close to where they work. Um, there are 45,600 of these communities nationwide. There are over 22 million Americans who live in manufactured housing communities. Uh, the median incomes in these communities are half of the national median, um, so this is critical affordable housing really for working class individuals. Um, I think this is a great slide here, and, and there was a story that was done in the Financial Times in which they directly compared a resident-owned community and a community that was owned by an outside investor. And this is the sort of dynamic that started to occur, is many of these manufactured housing communities have for a long time and are still today owned by sort of mom and pop uh, type operators who eventually, for one reason or another, are ready to sell. Um, the, because of the way that these communities operate, they're a very attractive investment uh, for investors who want stable yield. And the reason for that is that while we talk about manufactured housing um, using the term trailer parks often um, or mobile homes, in fact, the structures that you live in when you live in one of these communities are not themselves actually mobile. They're delivered to the site, they're installed on the site, and there they will remain, uh, slowly, in many cases, losing their value over time, uh, just like a car would. Um, but if you were ever to pick one up and try to move it someplace else, it, it probably wouldn't survive the journey. So while you're living there on site, you're also paying rent, and you pay rent on the ground that your box that you live in is on. You own the box, you pay rent on the ground. So while you are a, a renter, you're not actually able to pick up and move like anyone else. So when the property transfers ownership, if the new owner wants to raise rents and say that $600 a month payment you were making becomes $850 a month, you, have a lot, you don't have great options. Whereas if you were a renter and you had that kind of uh, thing happen to you, at the very least, you would potentially be able to move with all your stuff. Um, Rock USA has sort of stepped into that breach by figuring out how to help the people who live in these communities buy the assets that they, uh, that they rely on for their survival, which is the land underneath them. Uh, so what they do is uh, two things that are really critical. The first is they work with the uh, communities to provide technical assistance, create that homeowners association that is ultimately going to be the governance body responsible for managing the, um, managing the property once it's been acquired. Uh, and then they work on the other side to provide ready financing. You know, when you're out there in the market competing with, in many cases, some of the world's largest private equity firms, uh, you've got to have your lending tied up and ready to go if you're going to win the deal. Um, and so Rock USA is kind of that critical conduit for capital uh, to all of those communities. And that's where we step in. Uh, and we at Prudential and many others um, have seen this model, have been really excited about it, have wanted to support it as part of our broader affordable housing portfolio. Um, so I'm going to talk now to my colleagues and friends here uh, uh, and, and kind of get their take on this. But this deal came together uh, in large part because of the participation of Robert Wood Johnson. Um, and Kobe, I'd, I'd love it if you could talk about, you know, why RWJF was interested in helping Prudential with this deal, sort of what that looked like from your standpoint, um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, definitely. So, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so, just to give you a little bit of context about uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we are the nation's largest philanthropy that's solely focused on health and health equity. 
Um, really, we are, uh, our mission is, is to uh, advance a culture of health, working in partnership uh, with others uh, to be able to do that. And really, we're trying to strive towards uh, providing a fair and, just, uh, fair and just opportunity for everyone in, in the United States, really, to have uh, the chance to thrive, no matter who they are, where they live, or how much money they have. Um, just like other foundations, uh, you know, we're advancing our mission basically through grant making. And that really looks at, you know, sort of the, the 5% of our assets, really. Um, you know, we, the, even this last year, we, we, we granted out about $750 million. Um, so we have a, a, a $13 billion plus uh, uh, endowment. And I think it's really important that we think about how do we leverage the other 95 percent, essentially, right? So uh, this was a really a, a, a viable transaction for us to be able to do that. Um, you know, sometimes people think about the, the other 95 percent, and they're looking at, uh, you know, mission-related investments, MRIs, or really trying to, to invest uh, more actively through their corpus. This allowed for us, since we were really early on in our impact investing journey, really to be able to, to leverage our balance sheet uh, and really use the tool of guarantees. Uh, if you're not familiar with guarantees, it's basically a, a credit enhancement uh, that is similar to, for example, if you're going to, to school, uh, parents sometimes you know, credit enhance their, their, their children by providing um, you know, uh, guarantees on, on their student loans, they'll co-sign. And so essentially for us, that was a way for us to be able to, to advance our mission uh, using that tool. And, and so we felt that really, if we're gonna step into really leveraging and using guarantees, we need to figure out how we could also accelerate that. And so what we did was uh, go out and essentially get a uh, credit rating from Moody's and S&P. And so this allowed us really to, to, to have additional juice behind the, the guarantee that we were providing. Uh, and so, Really, why, why would we want to, to kind of back up uh, Rock USA and, 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 and help Prudential come into this deal? I think it's really around two, two sort of core ideas. And really, the first is thematically, we know that uh, wealth is a social determinant of health. As I said, we, we're focused on health. And wealth really ties into that, both from an ownership standpoint in terms of being able to control an asset but also just from a power building and agency standpoint. And for us, it was really important to, to, to be able to support the deal from that standpoint. The other aspect is really, we saw a really key opportunity around this from a very structural standpoint. So we felt that we could, using our enhancement, could really help Prudential really feel comfortable to come into this opportunity. Um, and really, our little guarantee really allowed for them to, to, to have space to feel comfortable about the loan that they were providing to Rock USA. So I say it's, it's those two issues that, that really uh, stuck with us and why we felt that this was really a good opportunity for us to lean in in this manner. Great. Thanks, Kobe. And I'll, I'll come back to something in that in a second. But Miliana, I want to just talk about your role in the deal because Miliana, for those of you who <laughs> don't know, uh, is not only a business uh, you know, partner of ours, but she's a former Prudential Impact Investor and knew intimately the challenges that we had with making loans to organizations like Rock, uh, which uh, you know, are smaller, less capitalized than the types of organizations that you might find on an insurance company's balance sheet. Um, and so she played a really critical role in matching what we wanted to do and how we wanted to support Rock USA with what RWJF was bringing to the table, which was this balance sheet guarantee to kind of solve that challenge. So I'd love for you to talk about your, you know, the role that Next Wheel Consulting in your form uh, played in, in getting this deal done. Sure. So uh, a couple things there. So I'm happy to be with a former colleague and a current client um, and friends of mine. And it really was a year or two of painstaking work at Prudential where we kept getting asked about risk-based capital and everybody wanted investment grade opportunities if we were going to scale impact investing. And I kept smacking my head at the wall saying, why do I care about this and why am I dealing with this? And uh, luckily it bore fruit. And the fruit was Kimberly Cornett, who is a colleague of Acobe's and probably known to many of you here, uh, when she joined at RWJF, brought me on as a consultant and said, 
how do we synthetically use the balance sheet to crowd in more capital for impact? And as it would go, those ideas come to you when you're running or when you can't sleep at two in the morning. And I said, huh, here's something that was painstaking for us at Prudential. And I think an important thing to note about the guarantee, and I could spend an hour going through all the technicalities of it, is what was critical about this guarantee is that it wasn't solving for perceived risk by Prudential as a lender. It was really solving for a challenge that insurers have in this space, which is if you're going to provide debt to non-rated opportunities, you will have to hold a very high percentage of reserves against those investments. And I will say it's very easy for corporates and others to make $100 or $200 million to, commitment, uh, to impact, because that's a rounding error. But if we really want to bring more capital into the space, we have to solve for these institutional constraints. And one workaround and what was really critical and unique about RWJF's balance sheet guarantee is it wasn't just a 20% guarantee, it was a full payment guarantee. Mm -hmm. And that allowed Prudential to treat this like it was a AAA rated asset and hold much lo smaller reserves. You can find me over wine and I'll tell you more about how the deal works. So, but in short, I think it really was work that I just was naturally doing at Prue with Ruben and honestly an, a prompt and a very blue sky prompt, which really got this movement going for the past two and a half years. And although this was a relatively small deal at about $5 million, what was really critical was getting the buy-in of the regulators and getting the right template documents in place so we can take this one deal and grow it much further. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, you know, without getting too far into the insurance company regulatory weeds, um, which I don't know, I can't tell if there's people in the audience that would be excited about that or not, uh, clap or scream if that's the kind of thing you really want to drill down on, um, or just put it in the Q&A. But in any event, you know, we, 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 Miliana is right that we do struggle with the fact that we are investing off of the balance sheet of the company. And if you have a life insurance policy with Prudential, you want to know that those your life insurance is backed by really good solid assets and the way you do that with many of those assets is you have them formally credit rated. And so that wrapper around this loan allowed us to feel comfortable with it as Kobe was saying and structurally it's a little different because we were able to, um, we, we had made a loan to Rock before um, and that loan had to be kind of directly tied much more closely to the loans that were on their balance sheet so that we knew sort of what our source of repayment was. This loan at their company level was able to be invested as equity down into right. their lending entity. So for those of you who are structural finance geeks, you understand that what that means is they could then borrow against that. So rather than our money going out the door directly into transactions, our money could bring in additional capital from other lenders to preserve hundreds and hundreds of units of affordable housing, which for us was great. You know, in, when we talk about getting to scale, there's the dollar scale but then there's also the housing unit scale, which we really need to hit um, and, and hit hard. Um, Kobe, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, from RWJF's standpoint, were there internal hurdles or, or challenges to like thinking about either the partnership with Pru, like partnering with a with a private insurance company, or um, you know, getting that credit rating and kind of the the work that was required to kind of put your balance sheet out there for inspection. Yeah, I'm smiling because Ruben knows that. Yes. This is, <laughs> there, oh, it was actually yes, was gonna be no. <laughs> no, there's there's definitely some, and I wouldn't say it was necessarily in terms of of, of working with Peru. I mean, the uh, you know what we're trying to do essentially is to through the through the transaction really uh, test to what extent um, you know we can help set the criteria or change the criteria that really are in place for insurers to to acknowledge what is considered investment grade. Um, using the guarantee for us, I think there were some operational um, as well as just some educational aspects for us to work around. Um, so at first it was just us getting comfortable with that inside the building, educating uh, staff on how this was going to look, educating our finance team, you know, what it was essentially that the, how the guarantee we would even assess it and evaluate it on an ongoing annual basis. I mean, you know, you have to check this thing every single year and have a, uh, a consultant look and say, you know, what's the likelihood of this being drawn against? And that makes, you know, a little footnote in, in your financials, these little things that we weren't used to doing and seeing, but it's really important to really live into to how we wanted to use this transaction. So there's that component of, of the education, of the, the structural administrative component, 
And then really, I just think the changing the mentality and the mindset of the fact that this was an outlay. I mean, essentially, we had belief that Rock USA was good on their money. They weren't going to default on this. And so we weren't looking at it as an outlay, right? This is just something that we're reserving, we're holding, but it's not to say that this is money going out the door day one, like a typical loan or an equity investment uh, that we made. So we had to shift that mindset within the building for us to get to really start to, to lean into using these tools more readily. Great, and, and Miliana, like looking at it from your perspective as you were putting the deal together, what did, what did you think of as being kind of the major stumbling blocks between the, between the two parties? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, listen, this whole idea was hypothesis. We knew enough about the quirks of the securities valuation in the NEIC, sorry for the technicalities, and we knew there was this workaround to have this loan to rock treated like it was a AAA rated asset. There was immense speculative risk, not knowing how Pru would respond or how RWJF would respond, but how the NEIC would respond. And it was a painstaking process to- NEIC is our regulator. Yeah. For those who don't, who aren't, again, insurance company executives here. And we could have put this whole deal together. Pru would put their capital at risk at a lower price because they were pricing this as if it was investment grade versus non-rated. And we could have closed this entire deal, done all the diligence, and the NEIC could come back and say, sorry, we don't buy it. And thankfully, they did buy it. And it wasn't an overnight process, but I think that was the piece of the puzzle that was very uncertain, very untested. We had a very strong hypothesis going in because we had folks with that domain expertise between the team at Peru and myself from having been there. Um, and that was a really big win, I think, for all of us. And as I said earlier, we didn't do this deal just to do one deal. We did it to prove, can this work? And ultimately, as we go out to crowd in more capital and do more deals, being able to say the NAIC blessed this transaction and our treatment of it is a big win. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say from, from our standpoint, as we got into some of those like stickier moments and where we had to, you know, we had to have some, so as, as with any good deal, there's moments where you've got to have some crucial conversations about how you're going to get it done. I thought, you know, we were all unified around the purpose of the investment. And that, like, I think got us through some of those times where we all agreed that this was a mission, this was an organization we wanted to support, and we were really committed up front to overcoming some of those structural challenges. Like, to Miliana's point, we kind of did this in order to take those on and prove those out a little bit. And so when those headaches came, it was not, um, you know, they were not all foreseeable, but we at least like wanted that, wanted that challenge. So, Kobe, now that we've done the deal, uh, what's next? Like, does R is RWJF, do you still have a taste for this kind of guarantee provision? Are there, you know, are you looking at other opportunities? What do, you, what do you think about that balance sheet capital now that you've seen how it can be used? Yeah, we're definitely uh, accepting the, the, the charge more and we really do want to uh, adopt this as a, a viable tool for us. Um, we think that this is a really a, a great sort of uh, pilot and, and really a, a first point for us to, to test and see how it is that the insurance sector essentially um, is evaluating what is considered investment grade and I think really what we want to be able to do is, uh, you know, get to a point where our guarantee essentially is not needed. So how, we, how can these transactions on their own merit essentially stand and, and not have to have an enhancement that's coming from, uh, you know, another sort of larger partner, us being, you know, being that partner, but how can they, you know, sort of be deemed investable uh, from, from other asset owners. And so that's the next sort of evolution really using these, providing these demonstration points, I think will be really critical for, for that adoption and mindset. And do you, have you gotten any kind of feedback or heard from your peers? Have they, are they interested in how you did this? They are, I think, you know, it's, it's um, you know, one of the things that I would, uh, you know, for those who have the ability from other peer foundations, you know, really look at your ability to get rated. Um, this is really a, a key way to, to think about how you can, uh, in a more, I would say more passive way, really leverage your balance sheet um, and, and also a way for you to uh, really, you know, put more capital to use in a way that sort of there's, there's less deemed risk. So um, I, I think we, we've talked to others around what that looks like. Um, and hopefully, you know, I think the water's fine. Come in, <laughs> join us, ask us, and we're, we're happy to, to share uh, best practices, advice, all of those things. Yeah, I mean, from the life insurer's side, I'll say that I've 
been uh, surprised, really pleasantly surprised by, as people have heard about this transaction, how curious they are and how much they want to talk about it. The insurance industry, I would say, is has a different um, kind of relationship to the impact investing space to the banking industry because we're regulated differently. Yep. And so we have kind of built this impact investing muscle in a very different way um, and for different reasons. But there are many other uh, companies, peers to Prudential, that are looking at impact investing, looking at the world and thinking about how they can use their capital to make things different um, and to improve life for uh, not just their customers, but for uh, you know all of the people in society, uh, and this transaction has been one that's been of a lot of interest to them. So you know it, the funny thing is the industry moves at such a um, glacial pace that like <laughs> <laughs> one or two calls a month about a deal is actually like kind of a lot for me. So um, th that's been really really great to see, and I'm hoping that you know next year we see that pipeline kind of really develop. Um, Miliana, you know, is curious like pulling back a little bit and thinking about your role as a consultant in this transaction. Um, it's not something that we always have in our deals, and it's, uh, you know, I would say it's, it's been a mixed bag sometimes when folks have, have been involved that way. Um, and so I'm curious what advice or thoughts you have both to others out there who might be either, you know, kind of working in, in consulting roles or also to your clients or potential clients about, What's the best way to use somebody in a, in a role like that? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. And I think in the case of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, it started when Kimberly Cornett joined two and a half years ago, and she was a team of one. So before she hired a Kobe and, and Zoila Jennings over there. And so I think one very practical use of a consultant is bringing someone on to be part thought partner and honestly just capacity as you're trying to get things off the ground. So one great use case for a consultant is before you have a budget and before you have sign off to build a team and maybe you wanna figure out what your team needs to look like and what expertise you wanna bring in. I think that's one very, very good use of a consultant. I think another really great use case is if you are launching or exploring something that is not in your wheelhouse. So I have many clients that are launching their first off balance sheet fund or their first investment fund where they need someone who has an investor hat, who knows what the collateral should look like, who knows, who's looked at thousands of pitches. So I, I would say to the extent that you are building something out that is perhaps a pilot or a test where you don't know that it justifies a full-time team member, but you need that expertise in-house to or as a consultant to add credibility, but also just to make sure you're moving forward in the right way. I think those are two really great cases and a lot of the work that I do for many of my clients. Terrific. And you, you know, have you talked to any clients about this transaction? Has this come up with any of the other folks that you're working with? Oh yeah, this is my pet project. So <laughs> it is, uh, no, I mean, and, and I think for those of you who follow Akobi or Kimberly or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the, the pull around insurance is a very, very big priority for the foundation. It is something that was already on Kimberly's mind. And to Ruben's point, there's a lot of positive momentum with new insurers entering the impact space. The ACLI, which is a trade association for life insurers, has been going big. There are many, many uh, state commissioners leaning into this type of work. And so this is only one example of many, many different work streams that are in the works at RWJF, so I think we're very excited about this for the reason I mentioned earlier, which is we're not gonna move the needle if every corporate makes a $100 million commitment once every 100 years. We really need to make this much more sustainable. You, to that point, um, you know, RWJF is based in uh, New Jersey, as is Prudential. They both historically have been there. They both come from these kind of multi-generational New Jersey uh, corporate relationships, and yet, until this deal, we really didn't have much of a history of working oh. together. And I don't know if it was because you guys didn't like us, or a little bit like of that. You, I, I, <laughs> a little from no. column A, a little from column B. Is the North Jersey, Central Jersey yeah. thing? I'm not sure. Right. But like, it really, it was, it was so strange to me to yeah. discover that you know you were doing all this great work, and it was it, you're touching different areas, issue areas from what Prue has historically cared about, but. Um, but I was surprised there was not a closer collaborative relationship. And I would say through this transaction, there is one now that is much more, like there's a much more open channel of communication. Um, my understanding is there's going to be some RWJF folks touring Newark, actually. Yeah, there probably is. Weeks. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's really important that we think about um, 
you know, how it is that, especially as a foundation uh, uh, employee, like how it is that we, that we really work with other actors who are outside of our typical philanthropic space, right? How are we engaging corporates? How are we engaging other uh, investors? And really thinking about their constraints, right? Like this, if we're trying to scale anything up, we have to be able to think about who else can come in and what is limiting or preventing them from being able to do that. I feel like this transaction allowed for us to have that, to have that room and really to, to, to make it comfortable for, for Peru. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to get to Q&A. So if you've got questions, burning questions of any type, uh, pull out your devices and type them into the chat, and I will look them up here on this iPad. Um, before I do that, I want to just give either of you uh, or both of you each a chance to talk about what your call to action would be for this group. If you wanted to leave them with one message, uh, take it away, whoever wants to go first. Uh, well, as I said earlier, this is a big initiative with, between um, or within the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So it's safe to say we are open for business. So I think there is a desire within RWJF to move hundreds of millions of dollars of capital potentially towards this effort. We are seeking folks that can help us with ratings frameworks, with pipeline, with policy, with um, insurance companies that are eager to invest. So I would say Feel free if this is of interest to you to please ping either a Kobe or me on LinkedIn or email or on the chat. I think we are, this is something we're really excited about and really want to continue moving forward with. And I would say it's two things for, from our standpoint. One, a practical is, practical matter is just uh, other foundations try to get rated and, and, and use that as a, uh, a way to really um, embrace and enhance what you're trying to do. And then secondly, I just, uh, as I mentioned, really adopt the mindset about being more collaborative, not only just with other foundations, but really with uh, corporate actors and corporate investors and really thinking about their constraints and how we can work to, to provide, provide solutions towards that. That's great. Um, all right, I've got a lot of questions here, so I'm gonna take it from the top. Uh, the first is, could the structure of this deal, in your view, support assets other than housing? Is there something special about the fact that this was a housing deal? Or could you see like a guarantee wrap structure on a balance sheet loan going to some other type of, of entity? So the, absolutely yes. So I think, and Ruben, you can speak to this too. The unique element of this deal was the full payment guarantee from a rated guarantor. Right. So it didn't matter. I, I think it does matter that the underlying transaction is debt because it's a credit substitution approach per the NAIC, if you really want to get technical again. But it could have been anything. Uh, it could have been for housing. It could have been for small business lending. It could have been a lot of different things. Really, what was important to this transaction was the full payment guarantee from a rated guarantor. So effectively, it was like giving a loan to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, it was almost a complete look through. I would say when we look to, so that was what was unique about this transaction. I think how we want to use this guarantee going forward is it doesn't help us to put this guarantee as a band-aid on things. What we're really excited about is where is there a misunderstanding or a misperception of risk where the guarantee can effectively be a bridge to better outcomes. So an example could be uh, more CDFIs having rated, rated securitizations or developing a ratings framework for affordable housing assets. So ideally, the way we'd want to use this guarantee is let's get the capital in, safeguard it, but go through a process where at the end of the day, the guarantee can burn off and we have a better ratings framework going forward for assets that we all know are stable, well-performing, and counter-cyclical. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I can see lots of different borrowers that we have that would benefit from, from this kind of a structure. Um, all right, so here's one that's uh, rising to the top here uh, because it's a little spicy. Uh, with a 100% guarantee from RWJF's balance sheet, it's essentially risk-free for Prudential, says this person. Um, how does RWJF make sure the foundation isn't basically enriching a for-profit insurance company? How did you get comfortable knowing or with the belief that that wasn't what you were effectively doing here? That's a good question. Um, I mean, so... It's not necessarily that we're enriching a for-profit. It's more so understanding that but for our capital coming in this way, the transaction would not happen or it wouldn't happen at an, in an equitable frame. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened in a way that would have allowed for Rock USA really to be able to afford this. 
So with the enhancement, it, it allowed, it, it lowered the cost of capital to, to uh, Rock USA. That would, wouldn't have happened without this uh, in wraparound taking place. So we're not looking at it necessarily from the standpoint of enriching or, or putting Prudential in, in sort of a better space. It's more so how do we allow for Rock USA to do what they need to do and do it in a way that allows for them to still have the necessary sort of margins and necessary uh, capacity really to deliver on mission. And there was just a really natural alignment. I mean, all of us knew each other. We knew what we were coming to the table to do, and we were effectively trying to recreate almost like an SBA government product. And I mean, I will say for a $5 million deal that took forever and a day to do, I don't think anyone was being enriched by the deal. <laughs> and also, I mean, if you know CDFI as well, we're not gonna lose, or Prue's not gonna lose money on this deal. This wasn't about Prue thinking this was highly risky. This was solving for an internal RBC issue. Right. That's right, which, which comes down to a cost of capital issue. Right. So, you know, risk-free lending doesn't really exist. There is a risk-free rate in the U.S. economy, which is somewhere around what the U.S. government pays to borrow money, which goes up and down over time. And everything, every loan that's on Prudential's balance sheet essentially has to look back at that and say, is this more risky than, you know, lending money to the U.S. government? If so, how much more and how much do you charge for that? And in many ways, this helped close the gap between something that is very low risk and really what Rock USA needed to fulfill their mission. Because if, you, if we were to price this just on the risk that we saw, the money would be so expensive they wouldn't be able to use exactly. it. Exactly. They would just be, they would say, no thank you, why did I come here to ask? Um, so, so this is what really closed the gap. The pricing that we gave was fair pricing for the risk that we were taking, and that's what our regulator would agree with, and so then they could feel comfortable signing off and putting it on the balance sheet. I hope that answered the question. It's a great, great question. Um, so uh, next question, uh, you know, why, how much underwriting and performance history did the rating agency require, or how much did, did they rely on the guarantee? And I can kind of take this one. I'll mm -hmm. say, you know, really, as Miliana was saying, that they were kind of looking through to the guarantee um, and weren't really invested in what was happening at the borrower level, which was great because what we did not want to do is spend months and months having a rating agency pour through the financials of a CDFI that we were already underwriting. Right. That's the beauty of the structure. And that having put that structure in place, it can be more efficient the next time because now you know when you give them the structure, they're going to say, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. I'm familiar with that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or that, yeah, okay. Um, someone asked, why not make the loan directly? You know, why, why not have RWJF just make this loan if this is money that you wanted to see, you know, end up in the hands of Rock? Yeah, making the loan directly, um, I think, two, it doesn't, one, one thing is that it, there's a direct outlay. As I said before, this allows for us to essentially uh, look at it from a leverage standpoint. So there's not, you know, with, a, with the, the guarantee being issued, we're not actually physically sending money out the door, right? So we could essentially use that capital to make another guarantee or we could leverage it in some other, uh, other way. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, also, just because of the way that we were trying to structure the deal, we, we knew that it was really important that this money go through to the CDFI and not directly to, to ROC. Uh, so, those are two issues as to why we wanted to uh, sort of structure it like such. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think everyone in this room could say they know of an organization that's gotten a 1% loan from a philanthropic institution. That's not moving the needle, that's not new. Really, this creative guarantee structure created a template and created a new dynamic, as Ruben said. Ideally, the second deal we did like this would be much easier to get through to the finish line. So I think for us, this wasn't about getting Rock USA the cheapest form of capital. It was very important to get them. This was 15-year money. It was injected as equity into the CDFI level where its covenants are tested. So it did provide a lot of value to Rock USA, but it also potentially put in motion a new transaction structure that could be very game-changing for insurers coming into the space. And I think that's a critical difference. Yeah, that's really important. I mean, I think it's really about, the, at the end, we know that our capital alone isn't, and when I'm saying us, I'm saying phil phil philanthropy, our capital loan isn't going to solve this. So if we can't entice and in be attractive uh, and allow for others who really have much larger 
balance sheets in us, then it's not really going to reach the scale that we're, we're trying to seek. That's great. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> I think that's, that's completely correct and, and consistent with, I think, how we would like to see this evolve into the future is that, that it kind of goes forward with that sort of a mindset. Um, so uh, one question is, I think is interesting and important, I think, for us to address is, what is RWJF thinking about in terms of the impact assessment on the guarantee or on the loan? You know, wh what are you going to be looking for uh, long run in terms of metrics? And I can talk about from Prue's standpoint as well. You know, we when we invest uh, for all of our impact investments, you know, we uh, apply sort of an, an analysis to the investment, we create impact KPIs, and then we track those over time. And so, you know, with, with Rock USA, because of what they do, it's pretty straightforward. You can look at uh, the number of communities that they lent to, the amount of money that was lent to those communities, the number of housing units, and the affordability level of those housing units, and then you can sort of track capital progress over time on the balance sheet of, of Rock USA. I don't know whether RWJF has anything else that you're planning to track through this deal. I mean, the other thing that we're also being mindful of and really paying attention to is just the um, demographics of the actual residents themselves. And we really are trying to, to get a broader sense. Um, we know Rock USA and sort of how they've operated and who they've sort of supported, but really also having that, those numbers and those uh, elements really elevated. So we're really looking at the demographics as well in terms of both from an income standpoint as well as well as from a racial or ethnic standpoint, um, who, who this uh, is really supporting. Great. All right. We're almost out of time. There are a ton of great questions here. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to them all. One question I did want to answer, though, was in the video. You saw Thistle Rock USA, and someone asked what that was. Thistle is one of the network of affiliates that Rock works with all over the country. So they're in 21 states, and they have an on-the-ground nonprofit partner that they're working with. Thistle uh, does a lot of different things in that community in Colorado, but one of the things they do is provide te technical support to resident-owned communities locally. Um, and so there may be an affiliate in uh, the area where you live, and I would encourage you to look them up because Rock does a great job screening for and working with super high quality organizations. All right, we are at time. Uh, this has been great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it, and uh, enjoy the rest of SoCal. Thank you.